continue something that we brought up last night. I'll be sure to bring you up to speed in case you are just now tuning in for the first time. Or maybe you missed what we were talking about last night. Ron Paul has made a splash yet again. And he's splashing in a very, very good way. People are upset. Uh, People on, of course, uh, the right are just livid that Ron Paul could win the CPAC poll, the Conservative Political Action Conference, uh, which is, I guess, a yearly convention that conservative types have. Well, apparently some liberty-minded people uh, infiltrated the ranks this year, and as they did last year, and Ron Paul uh, ran away with the... uh, there, I guess their little presidential straw poll thing, uh, winning 30% of the vote. Mitt yeah. Romney following behind with 23%. So a decided victory, I would say, for Ron Paul. Yeah, but like it wasn't close. And, and you know, it's a lot of young people, and so the Republicans are actually in the position where they have to complain about all these young people coming in and infiltrating their party and influencing their, their straw poll, which I find right. very interesting. And of course, it's the Republican establishment mainly. Yeah, it's outrageous. I mean, that people would be upset that young people are getting involved in this in the system. Isn't this what they want? Stinking kids! Right? Isn't this what they want? Well, here you go. They like Ron uh, Ron Paul. He's a real conservative. It's not what they want. What they want is for you to believe their message. You must believe our message of force, destruction, and putting uh, and you know and 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 getting getting involved in your neighbor's life. Because our version of force and aggression and and violence is better than the other side's. Yes. So people are upset, and one of those people is a man over at Forbes magazine, Rick Unger, who is accusing Ron Paul of basically being the political version of a crack dealer, offering (laughs) the American youth something they want now, which is freedom from some level of coercion, not totally free free from coercion, but Ron Paul's out there with a pretty principled message, pretty close. It's the most principled message you're going to find among politicians. Absolutely, especially at the The national level. Yeah, Um, and so he's out there pushing this idea, and this guy at uh, Forbes is suggesting that this is dangerous. It's uh, it's pandering to young people's feeling of immortality, that, uh, that they believe they can just take all their money right now and just spend it all and not have to save for their retirement. We need to have Social Security. We need to have government, uh, you know, Medicaid and government uh, control of medicine to take care of these irresponsible little brats because they don't know what they're doing. Wait, the little brats are going to be paying for them. That's why they're mad. Yeah. That's oh, what they- very <laughs> insightful. I didn't even make the, think to make that point last night. That is a good point. And maybe but the, the little other- brats just want to save on their own and have their own account that, well, that's the, just that, it. that the uh, Congress can't raid. The other thing, I mean, is that if you... Okay, yeah, it's true. Young people in a lot of cases are very irresponsible. But if they're not allowed to make mistakes, if they're not allowed to to learn how to be responsible on their own, then they'll just be sad, pathetic wards of the state for their entire lives. Right. And I know that's what the state wants, but I like it when people are uh, self-sufficient and you know can learn from their mistakes. It's an important and process. Self-actualizing and empowered. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously uh, that's what that's what people want is that, uh, you know, these people in politics want you to be uh, beholden to the government. Otherwise, you know, how can they control you? Sure. So speaking of Ron Paul, let's continue this story from Forbes dot com. It's one of their blogs. Uh, and I'm going to just jump in kind of again. We brought you up to speed where they're attacking Ron Paul for being a financial crack dealer. So Unger says, I can only imagine myself at 21 considering Representative Paul's offer. As I was absolutely certain that I would be wildly successful, hugely rich, and never have need for the assistance of the government, I would have snapped up Paul's offer in a nanosecond. Of course, I didn't yet know what Medicare was all about, let alone understand that at uh, 60 years of age, I would be looking forward to the program with great anticipation, (laughs) despite being fortunate enough to have some money in the bank. So in other words, this guy is a Republican welfare queen. Pretty Some, much. I, I, I mean, don't know what he is. Well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to claim that that much is true. You know, the, uh, the the but what he is claiming is that somehow Medicare is going to save you from the high medical costs. But what he's not factoring in is that since Medicare has come around, medical costs have gone up. Now I understand it's causation versus correlation, but when you <laughs> when the market was free in the area of medicine, you saw significantly lower mm-hmm. prices compared to what people were making at the time, what they call real dollars, um, than you do now. And you paid cash for things back mm-hmm. then. Not to mention the fact that his his glorious Medicare is broke, completely insolvent, broke, and it's going to go under. Even if I had been a responsible young man of twenty one, which is something of an oxymoron, I never could have yeah, foreseen. Wow, nice guy, huh? Yeah, this. Yeah. I never could have foreseen the high costs. I I was pretty responsible at age twenty one. Yeah. Me too. 
Uh, I, I've got to say I was pretty irresponsible. But I never could have foreseen the high costs of health care in the future, just as I could not foresee the unexpected medical conditions I would face that would drive the price of my health care coverage through uh, stratospheric levels. Indeed, I had taken advantage, or rather had I taken advantage of an offer similar to what Ron Paul proposes and rejected the idea of paying into Medicare, the Medicare trust, in favor <laughs> of putting more money into a retirement plan that would be decimated by the crash in the stock market just as I was about to need the money, I would be facing a considerably more challenging life when retirement arrives. When one considers that I got some lucky breaks in life and would still be behind the eight ball under the Ron Paul plan, imagine what would happen to those who did not get those same breaks. Medicare trust my prostate. 800-259-9231. That's the SACL CAI toll-free line. You can take control of the airwaves because in the absence of the government's Medicare program, no one would have a you know solid investment into uh, you know health care like you know like a health savings account. Oh, we already have those things. Huh. 800-259-9231. You can take control. It's free talk live. All right. So we're going to continue here. Uh, Ron Paul, according to Forbes magazine, is pushing financial crack. He's tempting the youth of America into giving up their addiction to government. and Or I guess he wouldn't use that term. He's tempting the youth of America into giving up the important lifeline uh, to government so they can take a risk with having their own money and deciding what to do with it and making the wrong choice and being irresponsible. Which, of course, eliminates the, uh, the whole po- you know, idea that people would be taken care of. He, he believes that people would not be taken care of in the absence of the state. That people who make mistakes would just be left along the side of the road and be you know, ignored, freeze to death, die, uh, starve to death, etc. And it's just, so, it's just so not the case. I mean, uh, the people that I know in my life are very compassionate. They are human beings who can see other human beings having having trouble in their lives and can empathize with those people and are willing to step forward and and help out presuming they have the means and the time and the ability to to do those things. And I think it's important to uh, consider that the marketplace is significantly more efficient than the government is at these kind of things. When you look at the government, you'll see that uh, they spend, uh, at least I've heard, welfare. Do- there's 70 cents on every welfare dollar goes to middle class bureaucrats that administer the program. So if you consider that you're, by turning it over to a not-for-profit, some of which, uh, you know, many of which will uh, turn those operating costs on their heads to the point that they need 30% for operating operations, not 70 percent, and 70 percent go to people, not 30 percent, but some of them actually put 100 percent. Many of these church organizations mm-hmm. are that way because they already have uh, you know offices and things in, in place, and they have uh, you know people that work for the churches. So you can see between 70 and 100 percent of the money go to people. That changes everything, not to mention the fact that uh, people can no longer absolve themselves of, the, of what they consider a moral uh, imperative to help their neighbors because, well, the government's doing the government that. government will take care of it. Right. The, the, so when you when you consider that people will have more money, that it will be taken care of in a more efficient fashion, right. you don't need as many dollars. Plus the fact that all the taxes that you spend don't go to welfare. They go to killing people sure. um, around the world. They go to all kinds of things. It's a very small percentage which actually goes to taking care of folks. We would all be a lot wealthier, and wealth includes the, you know, the ability to live a long time We would all and, and live healthily. Mm-hmm. Uh, we would all be a lot wealthier if it weren't for the federal government and all of its programs and its meddling and its aggression. And I'd like to add that, you know, over the last decades or so, slowly but surely, we've been disincentivized to save. We've been disincentivized to do a lot of to take care of ourselves because of this this uh, creeping government dependence that we've all been conditioned to accept. And Mark, a lot of what you just said, I would say, boy, you sound like a conservative there. Yeah, right. So, well, so how you're, but how how is it you could be contradicting this guy who's being exposed as a statist? Well, hopefully, I don't uh, sound as I uh, uh, hope I sound more compassionate than most conservatives can pull, come off saying that. Yeah, I um, think so. I, I was thinking about uh, welfare. Most conservatives are just like, I just want my money. Uh, no, I don't care about. <laughs> I, not I care about helping people. That's true. I, I, I was saying uh, that welfare is a very small percentage of the federal budget, and that much is true. He was talking about Medicare, which is an extra- extraordinarily large percentage of the, gov- uh, the budget plus Social Security, which is an extraordinarily large percent of the budget. So I guess I have, uh, I, you know, I, we're going to come back to, there. We're going to come back to Ron Paul, the uh, financial crack dealer in a moment. All right. So we're going to continue here. Uh, Ron Paul pushing financial crack, according to Forbes, where their writer, their Ron Unger, excuse me, Rick Unger is uh, bitching and moaning because he's uh, Ron Paul is tantalizing the youth of America with freedom. <laughs> and he thinks that they're too, they are just too bratty. 
They too are stupid. too irresponsible, too dumb uh, to actually have freedom. And, well, this Ron Paul guy is dangerous. He says, My, maybe a generation of people forced to realize their error when it's too late might serve as a warning to future generations who would go with Paul's 10% plan. Talking about like a, just a 10% overall cost to government. But if that's the case, Paul is simply using the present generation of American youth as a guinea pig to make his point. And that is wrong on so many levels. Like Ronald Reagan did? What? Well, Ronald Reagan spoke, kind of talked all that libertarian rhetoric. He yeah, but he didn't do anything. He didn't do it, right. But he, he increased the size of government by something like 69%, according to Harry Brown. Yeah, more, more than that. But what I'm saying is his rhetoric inspired a lot of young people, including myself. Hmm, I see. It wasn't until he got into office he was a big disappointment. But well, I never we know really... that Ron Paul is in office and has been there for that, over a decade and that's right, but actually a lot, does vote no. A lot of people, such as myself, never gave up those ideals. He was the first president I voted for in 1980. You're just an irresponsible brat. You know? <laughs> <laughs> do you think yes. you can make your own decisions and save for yourself and be free to make mistakes? How dare you? You're just you've just been experimented on, Wayne. You're just a guinea pig. I mean, the, <laughs> the suggestion here is that uh, the American youth are so such a bunch of dullards that they would be allow they would just simply be allowing themselves to be pushed around by this, you know. This old man, basically, and that uh, you know that they can't think for themselves, and they can't rationalize and figure out what's going on, and they're just being you know just kind of pushed around by all of these uh, older folks with their suggestions about freedom. And I think that people are smarter than that. I think that young people are a lot more intelligent than this guy mm-hmm. thinks they are. You know, and and when you think about Social Security, the uh, what it, it, it brings you a one percent increase on your money supposedly if you get it. Mm. I mean, that's less than inflation. It's a terrible investment. Now, admittedly, there, um, you know, <laughs> I I don't know what uh, this guy was suggesting that basically you'd take a huge hit if you uh, put your money into the stock market. But if you would have put, started putting your stock, your money into the stock market, if you were sixty two and a half or sixty five or whatever it is that you get Social Security at, and you had started when you were twenty. I suspect that even with the hit that the stock market took um, over the last you know, 18 months or 24 months or whatever, you'd still be better off than the return you're getting from Social Security. So I think that this guy is putting up a specious argument. The other thing, too, by the way, Mark, is that even if between 20 and 30 years of age you live it up and not save any money, if you start at 30 and that begins really your peak earning years, uh, you can still put away a lot of money between 30 and 62. Mm-hmm. He says, I would readily grant there's a difference between over-reliance on government as a substitute to taking care of oneself and government's ability to assist those in true need of assistance, encouraging behavior that inspires people to recognize the benefits, both financially and spiritually, of being responsible for oneself and one's family is a commendable and important objective. However, failing to recognize that America is a rich, if indebted country that can afford to do more for those in need than what was once possible is a giant regressive step backwards. What libertarians such as Ron Paul refuse to understand is that life is not the same today as it was during revolutionary times or to be more precise as it was in the south during revolutionary times libertarians are big on portraying themselves as jeffersonians yet they don't like to acknowledge that jefferson lived in a part of the country where life was dramatically more self-contained the wealthy survived quite nicely on plantations where they were served by slaves and other cheap labor what is he talking about here he sounds like a lefty he's he probably is he's just he's just a guy writing in a forbes magazine we don't know what uh, what his uh, political bend is but um you know he what the south uh, how how, (laughs) you know what he's trying to invoke slavery even though he, he's not coming out and saying it. He's trying to invoke all these images which associate with slavery and all these negative connotations. Yeah, ex- ex- absolutely. The wealthy survived uh, where they were served by slaves and other cheap labor who provided for the owner's needs. In return, the owners provided the bare basics of life to their slaves and employees. Hey, guess what? That's what the government is now. Exactly. That's what the government does. The government is the plantation owner. The people in the government are essentially the co-owners of that uh, that plantation. And the and uppity slaves want to escape. Right, that's right. And uh, the slaves are essentially getting you know the bare sustenance from their slave masters. In the, in this case, it's it's just the plantation structure writ large. It's not about justice. It's not about agenda. It's not about mobilizing people. It's about dialing for corporate dollars. These two parties have sold the U.S. government and the American people to the highest bidders. 